Hey there, everybody. Um, welcome to School Psych Podcast. We are very happy tonight to be having um, a really interesting conversation on psychosis. I think that it's something that um, as school psychs, we definitely need to be aware of because sometimes it just kind of falls into our lap and um, you know plops down in our office. So um, really good topic. Um, we're just getting out of National School Counselor um, Appreciation Week. So um, you know, we love you, school counselors. It's also the the week that we as school psychologists get mistakenly thanked for being school counselors by our family and friends, which is kind of funny, but um, <laughs> um, so that's good. And then we're also next week, I know going into the NASP convention. So we're excited about that. We are, I'm not attending. I don't think uh, the three of us, none of us are attending. So we're a little bit sad, but we're hoping that you guys will keep us up to date through social media and Twitter and, and all that fun stuff. We, um, our friend Eric is presenting there. So we're super excited for that. We're hoping that maybe he'll um, maybe do some live video or something, kind of be a, a little bit of a correspondent for us if he's able to do that. But I did want to point out that his presentation is going to be at Thursday at 2 o'clock, um, and it's called Building Capacity for Behavior Supports, and the session number is FB. S08. So um, check him out. I think it's going to be an awesome presentation if you happen to be lucky enough to uh, be at NASP. But my name is Rachel. I'm a school psychologist working in Maryland. I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca. Rebecca? Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm a school psychologist working in Connecticut. And we're hopeful that you guys will participate tonight. If you're watching us live on YouTube, you can comment right in the chat box. I do believe you have to sign in to your YouTube account, but then you can comment, ask questions right there in the chat box next to your video screen. You can also post comments on Facebook, on the Facebook page, School Psych, your school psych psychologist, or School Psych podcast page, or on Twitter using the hashtag psych podcast. So we're looking for you. I'm watching for notifications. And here's Anna. Hi, guys. I'm Anna. I'm a school psych working and living in New York State. Um, we did a little poll on our Facebook page for you guys um, to find out about your experience working with students with psychosis. We wanted to know how many students have you worked with in your career who are diagnosed with psychosis. Um, the top vote was between one and three, 49 people. Um, the second vote was, um, the second um, most popular was 34 votes for zero, um, which I thought was interesting. Uh, and then 10 or more, nine people, four to six, nine people, and seven to nine, three people. So uh, definitely something that some people have experienced a lot of, and a lot of people have experienced none of, which is a, makes this really interesting topic for us to share our experiences and knowledge on. Um, so I'd like to introduce our guest. Um, Aaron is a fifth year doctoral student in the clinical psychology program at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She's an outreach and education coordinator for the Maryland Early Intervention Program, which specializes in early identification, evaluation, and at risk for or in the early stages of a mental illness with psychosis. Thanks for joining us, Aaron. Yes, thank you, Anna. I'm really glad to be here and I'm glad to talk about psychosis. So I have a set of slides that I'm going to be going through, but please feel free to ask questions. If you guys want to have a discussion, it's completely fine. I prefer to not talk the whole entire time myself. So I am going to just share the slides so we can get started. Um, okay, so the, the topics that I really want to talk about today is early intervention in psychosis. So this is gonna include people who are having their first episode, as well as what's called the psychosis risk syndromes. This is a lesser known area of research, so I'm gonna try to give more background about what that means. So just to start in terms of the topics that I want to cover, um, I'm going to be doing an overview of psychosis. I'll try to kind of go through that fairly quickly. I know most people at least are familiar with the DSM-5 criteria for psychosis, but I want to do a brief overview of that because it's a nice introduction to talk about the psychosis risk syndromes. Then speak a little bit about the importance of this early identification and intervention, as well as interacting with students, particularly at school, in the classroom, who might be having some of these active psychotic symptoms. And then finally, I'm going to really briefly talk about this Maryland Early Intervention Program, specifically uh, the consultation program that we have that could be useful to really anyone across the country who might need some further information or help if they're working with someone with psychotic features. 
So just to start off talking about the impact of psychosis, we know it's about approximately 3% develop a psychotic disorder in their lifetime. It's about 100,000 adolescents and young adults that develop a first episode each year. We know that psychosis has a, a really heavy impact. So when you think about things like mortality rate, individuals with psychosis are 2.5 times more likely to die than peers their age. They have a reduced life expectancy by 20 years. So this is for reasons like uh, suicide. This population is very vulnerable for suicidal behavior, as well as since things like substance use. We see that often in this population as well. We also know that psychosis has really significant impacts on things like independent functioning, quality of life, as well as the impact that it has on family functioning and just kind of the general burden on the family. We also know just at a societal level, there's a lot of money that goes into dealing with psychosis each year. So as I said, I want to start by just giving a really brief overview of psychosis. This is purely based on the DSM-5. There's the five types of psychotic symptoms. So we have hallucinations, delusions, disorganized speech, disorganized behavior, and then negative symptoms. So to start off with the positive symptoms, delusions, these are false or fixed beliefs. And I have examples here because it's really important that you start thinking about these symptoms on a spectrum, because this is going to come up when I start talking about what we call the psychosis risk syndromes. So for example, with delusions, I think people are talking about me. This in itself is not even that uncommon of a thought, particularly when you're dealing with adolescents, that's, you know, a, an adolescent who was not even experiencing any type of psychopathology might actually have that experience that I, people in the school are talking about me. That's a lot less severe than someone saying aliens are sending me messages through the TV. So if we're thinking about this on a spectrum in terms of severity, you can see by those examples that there's really a range of how severe a delusion or any of these symptoms might be. Then we have hallucinations. So these are perception, sensory abnormalities. Um, these can be auditory, visual, tactile. Typically in adolescence, auditory or quote unquote hearing voices is the most common. Not to say that uh, an adolescent might not have, a, you know, they could still have a visual hallucination, but typically what you're going to see is hearing voices, that they're reporting that they're hearing some type of voice or something in their head. Then next we have disorganized speech. So this would be speech that's difficult to follow, kind of odd use of words. Typically in adolescents, it's uncommon for an adolescent to report that they're experiencing disorganized speech. So they're most likely not gonna be aware that their speech is disorganized. It's usually someone else, whether it's a parent or a friend or a teacher who's starting to pick up on this kind of um, communication abnormalities that someone might be starting to show. And then lastly, of the positive symptoms, there's disorganized behavior. So this is unpredictable, untriggered behavior. Kind of the hallmark example of this is someone dressing in an unusual way. So maybe it's really, really hot out and they're wearing, wearing multiple layers, uh, you know, when it's, when it's hot. Then we have negative symptoms. So these are things like social withdrawal. All of a sudden their grades have declined. They're no longer really motivated. They're not really just engaging in activities they once enjoyed. What can be really tricky though is when negative symptoms present first, when someone's having their first episode of psychosis, as I'm sure you can imagine, this might look like depression or anxiety. Someone who is first having negative symptoms, it's not gonna jump out that this could be psychosis. So oftentimes what we see is people might be misdiagnosed with depression or anxiety because they have yet to show those positive symptoms. It's also important to point out that there's a lot of times comorbidities, so it's not uncommon that someone could have psychosis and also be, have a comorbid diagnosis of depression or anxiety. So sometimes it can get tricky trying to differentiate these psychosis negative symptoms versus a different disorder. 
So who experiences early psychosis? Um, the onset generally occurs between the ages of 15 to 25. Uh, in the clinics at the Maryland Early Intervention Program, we start as early as 12, give, providing treatment for individuals who are in their first episode of psychosis. And it actually occurs equally in males and females. It just typically presents earlier in males. So in males, you might see it teens, early 20s. Females, it typically presents a little bit later, maybe early 20s to early 30s. So here's just some examples of some quotations we have from people trying to explain what the sensation feels like. So this first one, they talk about it feeling really overwhelming because it's almost like your brain's just not working. You can't really trust what your brain's experiencing um, because, you know, all of a sudden what feels very real to you you realize that no one else is experiencing that. So people start to kind of ex explain it as you can't really trust what experience you're having in your brain. Um, they also talk about how it can really impact social situations. So this speaks to some of those negative symptoms where we know that all of a sudden people kind of decrease in their activities, their motivation, because it becomes really difficult to interact when you're possibly having, you know, some hallucinations, difficulty concentrating, et cetera. So that's a really brief overview of just psychosis. Um, before I go into talking about the difference between psychosis versus these risk syndromes, does anyone have questions just about general psychosis? I don't I think so. so. I think we're going to get to it, Erin. Um, you were mentioning before we went on air about how psychosis is, is kind of an umbrella of symptoms. Right fall under different um, categories of uh, potential disorders or... Right, right. Yeah, no, that's that's actually, this is a great time to talk about that because, so psychosis, we kind of consider the umbrella of the diagnosis, which things that can fall under that are things like schizophrenia. You also could see things like depression with psychotic features, bipolar with psychotic features. So when I'm talking about psychosis, I'm kind of talking about this general idea of psychosis. These symptoms could really present themselves in a lot of different ways. And oftentimes, I'm glad you brought up that this idea of comorbidity. Oftentimes what we see is someone is experiencing a mood disorder like depression, bipolar, and then they're also having these comorbid psychotic features as well and symptoms. And that's, you know, as I said, where it gets really tricky with differentiating really what the presentation is because there's so much overlap in the type of symptoms that you're seeing. So in terms of, so that's psychosis, as I said, but there's this new field of research where we're really trying to focus on identifying people as early as possible. And what we're realizing is that even before someone meets criteria for psychosis, so they're in this quote unquote, what we call prodromal stage of the illness, they're actually still showing signs and symptoms. So what we know is that there are ways to actually identify people even before they have their first episode of psychosis with the idea that we can then get them into treatment earlier. So how do you recognize this high risk or this psychosis risk? There's a lot of different early warning signs that we can see. So people report kind of feeling like something's not really quite right. Their thoughts are jumbled. They're, they kind of speak about being confused. They really have trouble speaking clearly. There's also some unnecessary fear. So we see some early signs of that paranoia, some early signs of suspiciousness. And then of course, some of those negative symptoms. So declining interest in people, activities, deterioration and functioning. Of course, here again, we have the same problem. These are concerns are pretty non-specific. So there again, this presentation could simply be depression or anxiety. So it gets really tricky trying to make that appropriate diagnosis when these are these early warning signs could really be, you know, a, a lot of different disorders presenting for a lot of different disorders. So what we're looking at when we're looking specifically at psychosis versus psychosis risk are three areas. 
We look at the intensity and the severity of the symptoms. So that goes back to that spectrum I was talking about. The degree of conviction that the individual has, as well as if the individual has any doubt or question or insight to the symptoms that they are experiencing. So I'm going to give some examples to kind of speak to this, but you can see right here, I'm pretty sure the man in the black suit is following me, but that doesn't make any sense, right? So we see some early suspiciousness, some early paranoia, but they still are questioning. They still have some doubt as if this is real. If this was someone who was experiencing their actual first episode of psychosis, the statement would read something like, there's a man in the black suit and he's following me. There wouldn't be doubt. They, they wouldn't be questioning the experience. They would be very firmly believing that someone was following them. Here again, I think I hear footsteps at night, but no one else does. I don't see anything when I go and check, so I don't know. Here again, this individual is having that experience of maybe some early auditory hallucinations, but they're questioning if it's real. The fact that they are still questioning and not fully believing that this is a real experience suggests that they're not yet experiencing full psychosis but they are still for experiencing some symptoms. So this would fall in that risk state. So this is where we go back to these, this idea of symptoms on a spectrum. So for example, the halluc hallucinations. So going back to those perceptual sensory abnormalities, you can see on the one end of the spectrum, we have something like seeing indistinct shadows or flashing lights versus someone having a full-blown visual hallucination saying that they see a person hovering outside the second floor window. So you can see based on a spectrum, the indistinct shadows is a lot less severe than actually seeing a figure out hovering outside your window. So here again, we go back to, if we go back to the slide, this is talking about intensity and severity of the symptoms. So someone who might be at risk could be reporting these less severe symptom of maybe seeing a flashing light out of the corner of their eye. They keep kind of seeing shadows out of the corner of their eye. That's a lot less severe severe and significant than someone who would actually be in their first episode of psychosis saying that they see someone hovering outside their window. That's a fully formed visual hallucination. Similarly with delusions, if someone's saying, you know, they go to the park, they feel like people are staring at them, that's a lot less severe than someone saying, I can't go outside because my neighbor's plotting to kill me. So here again, it's important to be thinking of these symptoms on a spectrum because that's kind of how we distinguish between at risk and first episode of psychosis. The more severe, the more likely they're already meeting criteria for psychosis. The less severe, the more likely that they're just still in that at risk state. I wanna point out though, what we often see is when people are falling in this at-risk state, it's not unlikely that they would convert to psychosis. So we oftentimes see people, we diagnose some, we're saying they're in this at-risk state, and then they do go on to convert to their first episode of psychosis. So the idea is though, that we can identify people when they're in this at-risk state and get them into treatment earlier, which is gonna have a better prognosis, it's gonna be better for their functioning overall. So I have two examples here, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read through this first one, and then I'm just gonna talk about if this is psychosis or if this is a risk state. So Claire is a 17-year-old Caucasian female currently enrolled in her junior year of high school. Her mother brought Claire to see you after noticing odd behavior that caused her concern. Claire has an uncle with schizophrenia. Her mother reported that Claire's strange behavior has been occurring for approximately five months. Claire reported that once or twice per week, she has heard a whispering voice when she's in her room alone, but she was not sure where it was coming from or what it was saying. Claire felt it was possible that it might be a problem with her hearing, though it sounded real. During the interview, Claire at times needed to be redirected back to the topic and would bring up unrelated issues. Her mother reported that she was concerned because Claire hardly went out with her friends at all lately and they were not calling the house anymore. 
Claire reported that she thinks her friends gossip about her behind her back, but she was not sure about what they were saying. Claire's mother had also been contacted by a school counselor who informed her that Claire's academic performance was deteriorating dramatically from an A average to CD average. Claire and her mother both reported she has no history of alcohol or drug use. Medical tests have not produced any significant findings. So here we have a really nice example of someone who's falling in that risk state. So to point out some of the symptoms that are important. So there's odd behavior. She has an uncle with schizophrenia. So we know that there is a genetic predisposition, particularly with psychosis. There's certainly genetic components with, the, with these disorders. So she does have a genetic component. And we also know that this has been going on for approximately five months. So this isn't something that's kind of acute, um, that's just kind of perhaps could be drug related or medical related. This has been going on for, for five months, so a decent amount of time. We also know that while Claire is reporting hearing whispering voices when she's alone, she's really not sure where it's coming from. She's not sure what it's saying. So for Claire, this is still kind of less severe than some other auditory hallucinations where someone may actually be reporting, you know, I'm, this is the voice, this is what they're saying to me. This is still fairly unformed hallucination. So it's still in that kind of less severe state. Then we know that Claire also was thinking, well, maybe I'm having a problem with my hearing. So here again, she has some doubt as to how, how real this might be. Um, we're seeing a lot of those hallmark negative symptoms. So, you know, she's not really interacting with her friends anymore. She does have a little bit of paranoia here, thinking your friends are gossiping about her behind her back. But there again, it's not completely fully formed. So, you know, she, she, she thinks she has concerns that they're talking, but she doesn't really know what they're saying. So here again, a little bit less severe than someone who's saying, oh, people are talking about plotting to kill me. Um, and there again, you know, her grades de decline. So we're seeing a lot of those negative symptoms, but it's not as severe as someone who would be having their first episode of psychosis. So here's another example. So Diego, 17-year-old Hispanic male, currently attending his junior year of high school. His mother brought him in to see you after noticing odd behavior. Mother reported that his father has resided in a psychiatric hospital in Mexico for years for strange behavior, including hearing voices. Diego's mother reported that she would have brought him in sooner, but previously he had refused, saying he did not want to talk to anyone about his experiences. She said that recently he has not spoken much to anyone. She reported that a Approximately a year ago, he started being particularly picky about his food, more recently blamed the neighbor of trying to poison him to take him out of the picture. His mother reported that there was no evidence for this and that the neighbor was a close family friend, but that Diego has become very angry in the past when she has attempted to challenge his beliefs. She also said that Diego is frequently agitated at school because he feels other teenagers are plotting against him. Diego initially refused to talk to you, but later opened up, saying in a slow, flat voice that he felt depressed, that the world was so cruel, and that he would probably die soon from other people's actions. However, he could not provide specific details on why he thought this. He said that he found it very difficult to do anything and to express himself to others. His mother stated he's been in all special education classes for year, several years, and she was considering withdrawing him from classes as he was not progressing. He's reported that he very occasionally has one or two alcoholic beverages when with friends. Medical tests did not produce any significant findings. So here we have a good example who, of someone who would be in their first episode of psychosis. So a couple things to point out. He obviously is having some uh, pretty serious paranoia, being really picky about his food. So maybe he started with being at risk. So maybe it's just some general paranoia, being a little bit picky. Now it's progressed to the fact that he's saying, the neighbor's trying to poison me. The neighbor's trying to take me out of the picture. That is a much more severe and fully formed uh, suspicious thought than someone who's just saying, oh, I'm just, I'm a little picky because I'm a little concerned about my food. He really has it in his head that this neighbor wants to kill him. Also important to point out that when mom attempts to challenge his beliefs, he becomes very angry. So here again, this is someone that if he doesn't have any doubt, he doesn't have any question, you can't push him 
to say, oh, you know what? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. The neighbor's not out to get me. This is someone who's holding really steadfast to that belief and you can't be ch- he can't be challenged. That's a really classic example of someone who is actually meeting criteria for psychosis. When you try to challenge and they push back, they get angry, that is a really clear indicator that someone's no longer in that at-risk state. They have already met criteria and are in their first episode of psychosis. So to talk a little bit about the how we, we code for this risk state, I want to point out it is a recognized syndrome in the DSM-5, so it's called the attenuated psychosis syndrome. And unfortunately, for some reason in the field, we don't have, we haven't agreed upon one terminology for this state. It all means the same thing, but you'll hear people talk about the clinical high risk state, ultra high risk, the prodromal stage. They're all referring to the same time of when someone's starting to show these early signs and symptoms before they've met criteria for psychosis. So it all means the same thing. It's just for some reason we have different terminology in the field to describe it. But what I really want to point out is you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter really what we're calling it. This risk state is distressing and it's very impairing. So I would like to point this out because as I'm talking about, you know, differentiating between risk versus psychosis, I use terms like it's not a severe, not a significant. It's still really distressing when someone is starting to have these symptoms, these, you know, feelings of paranoia, these possible hallucinations. The start of having these symptoms can be incredibly distressing, particularly for adolescents and young adults. And there's also a lot of comorbidity, uh, you know, with anxiety, depression, issues with attention. And when we don't have appropriate services in this field to identify these people who are at risk, then we can't get them into treatment earlier. And so, you know, it's it's just really important to remember that, you know, regardless of if they even go on to transition to psychosis, they are still having really severe and significant symptoms and really could benefit from treatment. You know, I it's in this field it's there's kind of some back and forth about should we be identifying and labeling someone at risk for psychosis we know the stigma around psychosis we know what that term can mean to individuals to families but the idea is that it doesn't really matter what we're calling it if people are showing some of these distressing signs and symptoms early treatment is only going to be of benefit for them I also just um, kind of want to point out, too, that the reason it's so important to get people into treatment is these individuals are actually really at increased risk of victimization and abuse. So we know that the way the media often talks about psychosis and some of these more serious mental illnesses, they're often talking about how they, these individuals are violent towards other people in the community. Well, we actually know that these individuals who are experiencing either at risk or in their first episode of psychosis are often themselves the victims of physical violence. Um, looking at a recent meta-analysis, it was about 21% had experienced physical violence, 6% had experienced sexual violence. So I just like to point that out because, you know, talking very briefly about the stigma, we know that the way people kind of think about psychosis and, as I said, more serious mental illness, there's this idea that they are prone to be violent towards others, but we actually know that they really are at increased increased risk for victimization themselves. A question. So related to this, um, I know, because you talked about kind of that debate of, you know, is do we want to label this early on when, right. um, you know, with the stigma and whatnot, what are your thoughts on like military service? So from my understanding, if you have a history of mental illness, it might exclude you later in life from joining the military. So when we have these young kids that maybe we're diagnosing, are we potentially restricting them um, for career paths or is that something that's, you know, kind of up for debate type of thing? No, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, actually an, an area of research that's really close to me that I, I do in graduate school is about stigma work and serious mental illness. And, you know, it's, it's di- difficult because 
with just the way that our mental health services are set up and how we need to bill for things. You know, you always have to have some type of diagnosis associated with the billing, right? So the, we are always trying to say, okay, well, we have to diagnose someone if we're going to be giving them treatment. And so I think at least in this field with this idea of psychosis and like you said, the implications that it could have for, you know, future career, future schooling, whatever it might be, we try to err on the side of if we're not 100% positive that this is psychosis, we're not going to give a psychosis label. So if there's some signs of depression or some signs of anxiety, we'd be much more likely to provide that diagnosis and then be kind of quote unquote monitoring for psychotic features versus saying, okay, let's give them the attenuated psychosis syndrome diagnosis. Just knowing the stigma that's associated with it and kind of the, the burden that a label like that could provide, uh, you know, could, could have on someone. Um, but you know, I just, it's, it's a good question. And I think it's not one that we really have an answer to because, you know, I, I don't necessarily see the stigma around psychosis changing anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, and so actually a lot of what we do in our clinics through the early intervention program is not only are we doing treatment, but we do a lot of psychoeducation and anti-stigma work with the clients and their families so that the families kind of have a better understanding of, you know, yeah, you might have an idea of what psychosis is because of the media or, you know, TV. This is really what psychosis looks like. And this is the way to, to recover the road to recovery and try to provide hope for them. Because, you know, like you said, a lot of people hear psychosis and they think, well, that's the end. You know, I'm they're, they're My child's not going to get a job. They're not going to be able to go to college. So for us, one of the things we really try to focus on is uh, a hopeful recovery model, trying to ha ha make sure families understand that this is not something that is going to prevent your child from having the life that they want. Okay. So I, I want to now move actually kind of on the same vein of the importance of this. So yes, you know, we are labeling, we're diagnosing, but why? And why is this so important to do this work? So this goes back to the hope. So we actually have evidence to suggest that with the early intervention, we can actually change the trajectory of psychosis. So we've seen in the research that by getting early treatment for people who are quote unquote at risk, we're actually seeing fewer individuals convert to develop a mental illness with psychosis, whether that's, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar with psychotic features, depression with psychotic features. We actually know that people, if they get into treatment earlier, we might be able to actually prevent that conversion to psychosis. For those who do go on to develop a first episode of psychosis, if they're in treatment earlier, this is going to improve their long-term functioning. It also, earlier treatment is going to minimize the associated disorders and disabilities that come with psychosis. So there's only good things that can come from this early intervention and getting people into treatment earlier. So this is an important kind of map here of what the areas of research and focus we have in this um, field of psychosis. So as you can see, there's an arrow that says the onset of risk state. So that's the, the first area that I've really been emphasizing, this at-risk state. So that's one of the areas we are trying to address. Can we identify these individuals early on who are falling in this risk state and get them into treatment? So that's, that's one of our goals. The next is focusing on this, the arrow that says the onset of psychosis. So that means this first episode of psychosis. Currently in the United States, the time between someone has, a, when someone has their first onset of psychosis to the time that they go get treatment is approximately two years. This is called the duration of untreated psychosis. So currently, in our country, we're seeing a pretty long lapse of time from when someone has their these first symptoms to when they actually go get treatment. And there's a lot of different reasons for why that happens. Stigma is certainly one of them. People do not, you know, they don't want to go and even seek 
professional mental health. It's also just people aren't aware. They don't even really know the signs and symptoms to encourage people to go get help. But overall, we really want to lower this duration of untreated psychosis. And as you can imagine, shorter duration of untreated psychosis is going to be associated with better outcomes. So, you know, better social, emotional, occupational. The longer someone goes untreated is actually the time where we do see that more increased risk of suicide behaviors, the more increased risk of violence, not only violence towards others, but also the victimization of violence as well. So this period of untreated psychosis is a really crucial time for these individuals' health, and it's really important to get them into treatment earlier. The issue though and kind of what we're focusing on in this field is that it's really hard to identify people so you know as i talked about with the symptom presentation it's a really complex symptom profile it's difficult to differentiate psychosis from maybe there's depression maybe there's anxiety there's also a pretty low incident rate. Right? And I think that kind of was illustrated when, when you talked about the poll and how not that many people have interacted with individuals who do even have these signs and symptoms. So the incident rate is fairly low, which makes it even harder for people who don't specialize in this area to feel comfortable being able to identify people who have these signs and symptoms. Also, we know that individuals may be misidentified. So, you know, as I said, oftentimes we see people who presented first with negative symptoms, and so maybe they were misidentified as having depression or anxiety. And so there is a lot longer till they actually are correctly identified as having psychosis. I also want to point out um, very briefly that we know that there's a lot of overlap in kids who are, are actually experiencing autism, but who were incorrectly diagnosed with psychosis or vice versa. Reason for this, um, it has to do with the way that we kind of prompt and ask questions to get at psychosis. So there is a kind of gold standard assessment tool that we use called the Structured Interview for Psychosis Risk Syndromes. This is a tool that's a semi-structured interview. We ask questions like, have you ever heard something that other people don't hear? Have people told you you have odd thoughts? So questions really getting at those positive symptoms. But it can be really tricky, particularly with kids who have very concrete thinking, so someone who possibly is on the spectrum, who might be endorsing yes to some of these symptoms, but if you don't follow up and probe further, you wouldn't realize that it actually just has to do with the fact that they are thinking, well, yeah, you know, when I'm down in the basement watching TV and mom's upstairs, I can hear the TV and she can't. So I'm hearing something that she cannot hear. And so this, I think, actually brings up an important point about how you do kind of probe for these questions and, and how, you know, if a kid tells you that they're hearing something, how do you follow up and, you know, what else do you ask? So some kind of classic follow up and classic probes that um, that we have are things like, is it your own voice or thoughts? Like, are you talking to yourself? I know, you know, in therapy with kids, a lot of times kids are encouraged to process their thoughts out loud, kind of talk out loud as they're walking through something. So is it just that their own thoughts are processing, you know, they're processing something or is it a voice that they've never heard before? They're not familiar with it. Um, you know, was there someone in another room? Was the TV on? Another really important uh, distinction is, was it your imagination or did you think it was real? because kids have imaginary friends. Kids have very vivid imaginations and um, oftentimes that's developmentally appropriate. So you wanna make that distinction between, do they think that it's actually real and happening or are they aware that, oh no, this is my imagination? Um, another important distinction, did it occur when you were, were awake? Maybe were you about to fall asleep? Were you just waking up? So kind of distinguishing between those states when someone is really tired. So that oftentimes um, can be an important distinction. 
as well as asking so for some kind of cultural considerations, you know, do other people in your family or your friends, do they have similar experiences? Could be merely kind of a, a spirituality background. So trying to also get at that. All of those are really important ways to follow up with people um, or, you know, adolescents when they might endorse some possible symptoms. Um, so I'm seeing here that someone just asked a question. So it says, have you ever witnessed a child or adolescent or even adult getting treatment medication and at some point not needing meds anymore? So that's a great question. Um, one that I think is very important and I, I will talk a little bit about the Maryland Early Intervention Program very briefly and the clinics that we have and the model that we take. But so at our clinics, um, we have a very patient-centered focus. So if a patient comes in and, you know, they say, I don't want to be on these antipsychotics, they, I don't like the side effects, they don't make me feel good, the patient has that autonomy to say that, and we really work with the patient to have a treatment that they feel like is appropriate. So we have certainly had times where people say that they don't want to be on antipsychotics and we don't force them to be on antipsychotics. Um, I think I, I hear what you're saying in terms of a lot of times people feel like once you start medication, it's there's really no going back because you need that to monitor and um, kind of stabilize your symptoms. But we oftentimes see that, you know, people are able if, you know, if, for example, they don't want to be on medication, they don't like the, the feeling or the side effects of the antipsychotics, there are certainly psychotherapy techniques that can be used to help assist people with their symptoms. So, you know, I, I'm just thinking of an example right now where there was, uh, she's probably about 19 or 20, a girl who's been seen in our clinics who says that she often is hearing voices. She said, you know, pretty much on a consistent basis, I hear the voices in my head because she's chose to not take the antipsychotic medication. But instead, we've done more kind of cognitive work with her where she's able to challenge the voices or talk back to the voices. So she's not listening to them, but she's learned to kind of work with them. And that's her way of dealing with the symptoms without being on the antipsychotic medication. Um, so it's, it, yeah, it's very much like that kind of realizing, okay, well, this is a distorted thought. It's, that's not correct. And being able to challenge it. So it's kind of your classic CBT that you would do, you know, with depression or anxiety. Um, but we're just doing it with the, with the delusions or the paranoia that she might be having. So there are certainly ways to work around not people who are not interested in being in on antipsychotics. Um, let's see here. But, but yeah, you know, I think, and also I, I do want to point out that particularly with younger children, um, you know, when they first present, I would say that the first move, at least in our clinics, is not to immediately put them on antipsychotic medication because of that point that a lot of people feel like once you start, it's really hard to get someone off antipsychotic medication. So if we're working with someone who's really young, our first move would not be to immediately put them on antipsychotic medication. Um, so, so yeah, so, you know, I think this area of research and this field in general is a, an important one, but I think we have a lot more work to do with both early identification as well as early intervention. So, you know, what should the treatment look like? Should there be antipsychotics for the younger individuals? You know, we don't even really have an evidence-based protocol for young adolescents in their first episode of psychosis. Um, so, you know, we have CBT for psychosis, which is used for adults, but that hasn't actually been um, proven to be the evidence-based protocol that should be used for adolescents. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this field and a lot of research that needs to be conducted in order to better identify and better treat these populations. So I want to talk briefly about interacting with students. So if you are interacting with a student, if there is someone in your school who is experiencing their first episode of psychosis, how do you deal with that? How do you approach that? Um, I want to point out, first of all, that knowing what to do for the symptoms of psychosis can be really difficult. Oftentimes, it's hard to know what to say, what to do. It can be very stressful. And 
there's not always a correct or right way to respond. Oftentimes when someone's having these experiences, it's very individualized to that child or that adolescent. So I can't just give an overall, you know, this is exactly what to do. This is exactly what to say. But these are at least some things that you can keep in mind. Um, first being, if someone is actively experiencing psychotic symptoms, they're going to have a lot of difficulty concentrating. Really important to keep your statements very short. Give just one message at a time. Also let the individual know that you are trying to help them because if they're experiencing some paranoia, some suspiciousness, they might, if you approach them to try to help them, they might take that as a threat. So you, the one of the first things you want to say is, I, I just want to help you. I'm here to help you and emphasize that message to them. If someone is experiencing delusions or hallucinations, you certainly don't want to argue. So not saying that's not real. No, you're not. Except that that is their reality. So statements like I can't see them or I can't hear them, but I know you can. Because for someone who is ex actively experiencing these symptoms, it is their reality. It feels real to them. So we want to acknowledge that. And also recognize that their emotions, their reactions to these symptoms are very genuinely experienced. So yes, we might know that you know the hallucina hallucination is not real, but the emotion and the, the reaction that they're having to it is very real and very genuine. Um, making acknowledgments so I can see you get really angry when you feel people are laughing at you. So acknowledging the person. It's also important to not go along with their delusion. So while we're not challenging it, we're not arguing with them, you don't want to agree that you, you yourself can see something or you yourself can hear it. So it's just really important to be listening and sympathizing with the experience, but not agreeing that you're also seeing or hearing something. Um, also important, if someone is in a classroom and actively having these symptoms, to really try to eliminate stimulation during this time. So if they're in the classroom, they're very distressed, trying to get them away, not have them be surrounded by a lot of people or students at that time. Um, I also think it's really important if someone is experiencing a delusion or even a hallucination, try to use a distraction technique. So try to find a neutral topic to talk about so that they're not focused on the delusion at that time. That really can help with lowering their distress level. And lastly, I just wanna really quickly point out with, with this population, we really do see um, a high vulnerability to suicidal and homicidal ideation. So any threat, any gesture of self-harm or violence should be taken seriously. And I know, you know, a lot of times people say, well, what if the kid's faking? What if they're doing it as an avoidant technique or they're trying to get attention? If you have any concern that the student might have some of these signs and symptoms of psychosis, any threat or gesture should absolutely be taken seriously and get them, you know, medical or mental health care uh, immediately. And it's also okay to talk about their possible suicidal ideation. So talking about suicide doesn't make it happen. And if anything, with this population, it's really important to be talking about it, asking if they're feeling safe, asking if they're thinking about hurting themselves, because you know we wanna be doing safety planning, we wanna be doing risk assessment. So it's okay to have these conversations. And in fact, if, if there's someone who is in their possible first episode of psychosis, it's really essential to be having those conversations. So lastly, what I really quickly want to do is talk a little bit about the Maryland Early Intervention Program and this model. So the model was created um, through, it's actually funded through the state of Maryland to kind of work on this early intervention model of trying to identify people early, get them into treatment early. And so the goals behind this program are that we want people to not only be able to manage their illness, but actually really move successfully through life, have the life that they want. So, you know, here again, you think maybe 10, 20 years ago, someone had a schizophrenia diagnosis and it was thought that, okay, well, that's it. They're not going to go back to school. They're not going to go to work. We know that's not true. We have seen time and time again that a diagnosis like this is not something that ha is going to completely ruin your life. These individuals can have the life that they want as long as we're getting them into treatment. 
Um, and it's also really important to take a very broad public health perspective when you're working with this population. So addressing issues of aggression or of violence or substance use. We see there's a high comorbidity with substance use as well. So for one of the things we do is trying to provide this education. So, you know, as I, I said, I'm part of the outreach team. We really want to teach providers. We want to teach people who are likely to have some type of interaction with individuals who might have these signs and symptoms. We want them to know what to be looking for. We also provide, you know, trainings on the assessment tools, evidence-based practices, and just give some information on, you know, what do you do if you start interacting with someone who you're concerned might be presenting with early signs of psychosis. I just wanted to briefly put this up here. So, our team created, uh, it's a website, the MarylandBehavioralHealth.com. It's a completely free site. All you need is an email address. If you're interested and you want more resources or you know, there's professional development training, if you wanna consult with experts, some of the head doctors who specialize in first episode psychosis have all took, tur took turns making these modules and I believe there's about 24 of them at this point. So these are just some examples of the training modules. But if you have any interest in learning more about this topic, this is a really great website to get some more information. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to go into too much depth. I know that not everyone has the is living in Maryland, so would be using these resources. But just to kind of quickly talk, we have different clinics across the state of Maryland. So, for example, this one, the Strive for Wellness program, is specific for kids at, at risk. So we do work with kids 12 to 25. It's a great program because it's working and kind of monitoring kids to see if we can stop that progression to first episode of psychosis. And then we also have a clinic called the Raise Connection Program. This is for someone who's in their first episode of psychosis. And it's a really nice model because, as I've emphasized, we really are we're concerned about patient-centered care. So each individual who comes to this clinic, they have a team leader, they get a recovery coach, they have an employment and education specialist, depending on if they want to go back to school or back to work. And they also have a, a psychiatrist, but it's a shared decision making model. So if they do not want to take the medication, they don't have to. Um, so that's just one of our clinics. And then we have another clinic called MPRC. That's another first episode clinic in the in the state of Maryland that kind of offers therapy and psychiatry and family therapy, et cetera. What I really want to emphasize, though, is this consultation service. So this is a consultation service that is completely free, and we provide assistance or consultation for any individual ages 12 to 25. So if you're working with any individual, they don't have to have um, a diagnosis of a mental illness with psychosis. If you just have any questions, concerns, you think they might be presenting with some signs and symptoms, you can call our consultation line and they can kind of advise you on answer, really answer any question. Typically the way the consultation works is they're being seen already by someone in the community or by a psychologist who is providing them care, but the psychologist might want some additional information, might have some questions about appropriate treatment. So we can provide consultation on things like diagnosis, we can provide treatment recommendations, school and family management. And so obviously we can do it at our clinics, but given most people don't live in Maryland, it can be by the telephone or, the, or email. And we're also currently piloting consultation via telepsychiatry. So you could talk to one of the psychologists or the psychiatrist via telepsychiatry and ask uh, questions that you might have about the case that you're working with. Um, and then lastly, something that we're doing, um, currently it's just throughout the state of Maryland, but this is kind of a model that we're hoping other people will adapt is we're going out to already established clinics, mental health clinics, and we're training the clinicians on this model. So we train them in the assessment tools, we train them in evidence-based treatment, and then we continue to consult with them with the hope that, you know, this area of research is not that well known. Um, you know, psychosis in general, most people who study psychosis or who are familiar with psychosis, they work in the adult field because that's typically where it's presented in the past. But we now know that at risk and first episode of psychosis, that's starting 
very early. That's starting as, you know, in adolescence. And so there's this disconnect from people who mental health clinicians who specialize with children versus people who are specialized in psychosis. So what we really want to do is we want to go out and train mental health clinicians on this psychosis model. So, you know, they're already very well trained in mental health in general. We want to give them this extra training to specialize in psychosis with adolescents and young adults. So that's kind of this extra model that we have of training and implementation. So I just want to emphasize here, any questions that you might have is, um, can be answered by one telephone line. So if you do live in Maryland, you are making a referral, it's the same line that you would call for a consultation. It's one main phone number, or you could fax information, you can email information. All of that, you know, it's all the same. Consultation, referral, a just simple question of, you know, where do I find information about this evidence-based treatment? It's all one phone number. You don't have to worry about figuring out who to call. It's just that one main line. And it's nice because it is staffed by a master's level clinician. So oftentimes the person on the phone can answer your question right in that moment. But if they personally don't have the answer, if it's better advised to be answered by one of the psychologists or psychiatrists, they will call you back to give you some further information. And really anyone can contact us. So an individual themselves, family members, providers, anyone is able to call us and get further information. Um, if you are calling to, you know, talk about a specific client, if you want to make a referral, if you are the provider, the EIP always follows up to provide, you know, give as much information as possible. If you made a referral, they'll kind of let you know where that individual landed within our clinics and what type of diagnosis that we have. So when in doubt, feel free to just call our main line um, and we can really do any type of consultation, answer any questions that you might have. So that is all I have. That is super awesome. I think that that, um, that consult service is really phenomenal. And I think that um, I'm hoping that people make use of it. Because I know that myself, I have limited um, experience with psychosis. And so I think that it would make me feel a lot better to have somebody who I could call up and kind of run things by. <laughs> right, right. Um, I did have a question. Um, so say I get a kid in my office and, you know, we haven't had a documented first episode and things are really sounding concerning. I mean, we're fixed in our beliefs and, you know, it seems kind of vivid. What, um, in that case, I'm thinking that, you know, going to the hospital would be kind of the best bet. Is there like a, a procedure a protocol that you would recommend or how, how do, how do schools, how should we handle that? Yeah, so in that case, I, what we would always advise is to, to have the kid go to the hospital because when someone is actively experiencing psychotic symptoms, there's a much higher likelihood they might engage in some suicidal behaviors or homicidal behaviors. And so particularly if it's pretty, you know, one of their first times that they're having those experiences, given the amount of distress that we see, an adolescent is having, we always advise to just have them go to the hospital. And we actually, through EIP, we work very closely with the ERs and emergency departments so that they have our information and then they can make referrals to us. So that's kind of our standard line is we, we would just advise to have them go to the hospital and then the hospital can deal with referrals after that. Yeah. Great. That consultation service sounds amazing it's so helpful because um yeah i feel the same way as you rachel um so erin thank you so much for all this really valuable helpful information i'm sure that we will be referring um to the powerpoint in the future and keeping those numbers handy thank you so much for your time today of course yeah thank you for having me Oh, it looks like, sorry to interrupt, it looks like maybe we have a comment that I think is relevant because I, I was kind of thinking the same thing. Somebody just said, um, I have a student, and let me cut and paste this over here. Um, I have a student who has reported hearing voices over the past couple of years. The parents stated that their family believes in speaking with spirits 
uh, spirits. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to respect um, their belief system. So I've had that as well, or uh, two times actually, where I've had students who have said that they hear things and the parents, I'm not sure if they're probably reinforcing at home, like, oh, good job, you're special, you're, you're hearing, you're talking with grandma. I'm like, um, so I'm concerned on my end, but the parent isn't and thinks that this is a good thing. How do you, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Yeah, it's it can be really tough um, because those cultural considerations come up a lot, actually, when we're doing these assessments. So typically what we do, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have the SIF. So that's the Structured Interview for Psychosis Syndrome. And we can, that's a nice tool to use because it goes through kind of all of the different positive symptoms that might possibly be presenting. And so in a case where someone's reporting hearing voices but not reporting any other symptoms, we're a lot less concerned if the parents are like, you know, yeah, it's kind of in our family, we have this these spiritual beliefs, versus if a kid reports that parents aren't concerned but are also reporting other symptoms, then that's when we would actually kind of sit down with the parents and provide some psychoeducation about presentation of psychosis. Because oftentimes you're not just gonna see one symptom without any other presentation. So that's kind of a, a nice way to try to find that, uh, you know, to differentiate, is this just spirituality? Is this a cultural consideration versus, is this actually the start of psychotic symptoms? Um, but it, you know, at the end of the day, we have certainly had parents who firmly don't believe that their kid is experiencing the symptoms and there's really nothing we can do post providing the psychoeducation and advising that they should be in treatment. You know, if particularly as with adolescents, it's really up to the parents to ultimately decide if they want to continue to bring them into treatment and if they, they really think there is a problem. Yeah. That's really helpful. Um, um, I know we're at, we're running uh, at to the end of our time, but just a thought I had. Um, you mentioned that sometimes um, when you're still deciding whether you're in that at risk state or whether it um, whether it really is a psychotic episode, that you, that a student will sort of push back if you um, challenge. If, yeah, if you challenge them, have you have you noticed, or would it be typical that a student may feel embarrassed? Because my thought might be that they would, if if they felt embarrassed, then they're f further away from the psychotic episode because there's there's that sense of this is this isn't real. Is that right? Um, you're absolutely right. Yeah, be because a a kid who was in their first episode of psychosis, they wouldn't be feeling embarrassed because they would think it was real. To them, yeah. that would be the reality, so there wouldn't be a reason to feel embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But we certainly see kids who are at, in that at-risk state who are nervous to, to explain those symptoms because they know that something's off and they know it's really odd, so they don't want to talk about it because they're embarrassed about mm -hmm. it. But that's absolutely a really good distinction because yeah. someone who's actively experiencing psychosis would believe it's real, so they wouldn't be having that sensation of embarrassment. So interesting. Well, thank you. Thank you, viewers, for your great questions. And um, if you have further, if you have more questions or thought um, after our episode, please feel free to comment on School Psyched podcast page or send us, shoot us a message somehow, and we will, can continue the conversation over time. And we can certainly get more questions to Erin, who's so generous with her expertise and her time. Thank you again, Erin. And to, um, next week, we're actually back with another episode of School Psych Podcast with Dr. Richard Cash, who's going to be talking to us about self-regulation strategies for school and classroom. So I hope you tune in again next Sunday. Thanks, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.